Monkees were a hit series here on NBC. They won 24 gold records. They had five successive gold album, albums. They were as big as any rock organization around, including the Beatles. People in the record industry said that they were a big hype, as I said, a capitalistic creation, but they left their mark on the entertainment industry. This goes on for about 20 more minutes if you want to have a cigarette. It sounds good. <laughs> great. Here are two of the monkeys now, Mickey Dolans and Davy Jones. Hello. Hello. Hey. Nice to that have had you. That sounded great. Nice to have had you here, guys. It was great. <laughs> yeah, thank, thank you very much. Tom. You brought with you the little ad here, which you don't have to Yeah, show. I didn't have a chance to give you anything, but it, it says... Uh, Can you read that thing I'll read? It just says madness, and this was the auditions that we uh, had to go to. It says folk and roll musicians, singers for acting roles in a new TV series. Running parts for four insane boys. They got three at Mickey. Age 17 through 21. Wanted spirited Ben Frank types. That was, uh, must have courage to work. Ben Frank is a restaurant in town here where all yeah. the but long hairs in the 65, 66. Okay. Okay. It wasn't too... Uh, what they did is interview about nearly 400 guys between here and New York. Everybody in the industry was interviewed. Everybody from Stephen Stills, who told Peter Tork about it, to Paul Williams, who's never forgiven me, because he was up for it. He was also up for Circus Boy, which is another show that I did when I was a kid. <laughs> Paul Peterson, I mean, everybody at the time. Paul Williams auditioned for the monkeys? Oh, yeah. Everybody when, in the city. When you call that number that was in the newspaper there, what did they say to you on the telephone? Myself, I um, I didn't call the number because I was signed to Screen Gems, Columbia Pictures, out of New York. I was appearing in a show called Oliver. Mm -hmm. I was the Artful Dodger on Broadway. And I knew the uh, um, the execs at uh, Screen Gems, and they'd see me on the stage, and they signed me to a, a term contract, I think, where they didn't give me any money, it just kept me on hold. And finally, in 65, late 65, the monkeys came along, and as a contract player, they put me in the show, and... Uh, I was fortunate to run through the scenes they wanted us to do with Mickey. And we, we, got both, along really. we both made an impression on So it. you had some suction going in because... He was a write-in, yeah. I, I, I sort of did because they, they'd had their eye on me as, a, as an entertainer from a few years before that. And so I was pretty set on doing the show. I'd what, done one what, album with did, Screen Gems. Did you come in cold, though? Did yeah, you? I came in cold. I came in um, through an agent. And um, what they wanted was four very individual characters that would come across visually, not just on record, because they weren't too interested in the record into the business. It was a television show about a rock and roll group. Mm -hmm. So David and I came in as actors. Mike and Peter came in more as musicians. So there, therein lay the balance, because they wanted something that would come across visually. You couldn't just stand up a rock and roll group gotcha. every Monday night for half an hour that all look alike and act alike and talk alike and hope to carry off a visual impression. So that's why they really were looking for those characters that wouldn't conflict with each other. At the beginning, though, did you know or were you told that you would be expected to make records, that you would be expected to make music? Yeah. I think we were told. I just don't think we knew what we were getting into at the time, how big, how yeah. big this project was and how much interest, not only from the people around us, not only from Screen Gems here in uh, Hollywood, but in um, and around the country, from New York to their Chicago offices to their television stations, radio stations. They had a plan, obviously. And... Uh, Hopefully we can... Uh... The plan didn't, uh, didn't involve the record industry, though. And that's why there was a lot of animosity and a lot of jealousy from the, re from the record industry, who we didn't need. We didn't need the radio stations or Rolling Stain, uh, Stone magazine. Or, <laughs> <laughs> or, um, was that purposeful, what you just... No, I'm only kidding. Oh, no. kidding. They were never kind to us, but it didn't matter. No, you and had we, the television network. Exactly. We had a half an hour commercial for the records on every Monday night. So there was a lot of jealousy and animosity because we didn't come up through the ropes. Mike once said that we appeared over Guam in a cloud and just settled to the ground. It was the first time that the television industry and the record industry combined forces in a concerted attack against the American consumer. Uh, and that was the plan. I don't think anybody could foretell if it was going to be successful or not. But it's the first time there was really a concentrated, united front. There had been overlaps with Dick Clark and uh, Paul Peterson released a record. But this was literally... Uh, a package where RCA and Screen Gyms um, went all out. To we will develop a group, we will promote that group, we will expose that group to the audience on NBC right. on Monday night and color television, and then right. once we have them hooked, right. we'll have a marketable product. And Bert Schneider, who produced the show, and Bob Rafelson, um, knew that to pull it off, they had to find four guys that could pull it off because 
we were awful. We were affected, at least I was, by a lot of the negative criticism until years later the show was still being successful and the records were still being played and I finally could come out of my, my house and go, is anybody going to throw anything at me? You know, because you, you certainly, even though you don't like to believe the critics, you do. So the success lie in the fact that um, they did pick four guys that, that could work together and improvise. Did you ever feel, David, that you were conning people? Well, not really, because show business is a fantasy, you see, you know. We've got we to gotta plan and prepare, just as you do. Um, maybe not always. Sometimes you come on cold, but you must prepare some kind of something before you do go in front of an audience. And so this was just a huge organization that was bigger than normal and had bigger and better plans and new innovations into the, the, uh, the, the television, which was then um, film. There was no video. It would have been much different now doing a monkey show with video. It would have been laughing. Mm -hmm. it, which is, in fact, what we wanted to do towards the end of the second season. We wanted to try to change the format because we had, as actors, Mickey and I, had been in other productions before. We'd called in, whether it's uh, talking to somebody or whether it's uh, singing and dancing, and we've been able to go along like we just finished a, a run up at the uh, Sacramento Music Circus up in Sacramento. Uh, in Tom Sawyer. For Lewis and Young up there. And, um, it's a different sort of a thing. We are used to do, standing, I was used to doing my, I had a few TV series in England and I'd been on the, on the West End stage and I was used to being able to take direction. Mm -hmm. And with Mickey and myself, we were able to take the direction that was given and help develop. We weren't just two fellas such as, we weren't just musicians. We, we developed into musicians and since we've written songs together and we've had songs recorded. And, uh, we were actors hired to play the parts of rock and roll singers. So to us, it couldn't have been a con any more than Lauren Green playing the part of, of Ben Cartwright. That was a fantasy. Of, you know. How did you make the leap, really, from being actors to being quasi-musicians? Somebody must have taught you. We all had overlapping uh, capabilities. David and I, David had been on Broadway singing. I had my own rock and roll group called The Missing Links. And we'd I all, we both watch TV, you know, we all, yeah. our, uh, our peers were uh, Frankie Avalon and Elvis and the Beatles were there. So we had good, as actors, you see something and you're able to mimic it, you see. I'm the only one that really had to, to jump right into it and learn a new instrument. I'd play guitar, a little classical guitar mm -hmm. and a little piano, but I had to, be, I had to learn to play the drums because Mike was going to be the guitar player. Peter, who is an incredible musician, plays seven or eight instruments, went to a conservatory was going to be the bass player, and I couldn't, uh, Davey uh, was going to be the stand-up in the front, short and cute with a microphone, so I had to be the drummer, uh, because nobody else was there yep. to be the drummer. So I learned, and I learned quickly. Right, exactly. He was going to be the drummer, and Mike and uh, Peter and myself took a step backwards, and he was standing there, right. that was it. And I learned, and I learned quickly, and I learned well, because I have a, a little musical talent. Mm -hmm. I had about six, eight months. What was the first recording session like? Oh, boy. Well, it, it, was, it wasn't... Um, Quite a few. We didn't get together for any particular tune. We, we, as the Monkees, recorded and had lots of hit albums, and maybe we uh, recorded a total of maybe 250 songs. Not all of them were ever put onto albums or singles. They were used within the TV show mm -hmm. to put pieces together. But as the second season started to go, they knew the value of this time with uh, music playing uh, uh, around the monkeys, and so they would obviously take what they had in there and put in I'm a Believer or I'm Not Your Stepping Stone or Last Train to Clarksville, one of the songs that were the hit songs, yeah. and they would milk and push that. And that's, you know, it's good planning, and that's what you're supposed to do. It's engaged in profit for calling, professional, you know, you don't... They surrounded us with incredible people doing, the, for the whole show, it wasn't just a fluke that, that Bert Schneider and Bob Rafelson happened to be the producers, and. Um, Carol King wrote the songs, and Harry Nielsen, who had his first hit with us, and Paul Williams wrote some of the tunes, and uh, Neil Diamond wrote our biggest tune, I'm a Believer. Neil uh, Sedaka. Neil Sedaka. Donnie Kirshner was the music supervisor at the time. He was, had come out of New York in publishing. So he was mm -hmm. made music supervisor. And I remember at one, of the, at the one of the first sessions, we were surrounded by all these executives uh, from NBC and, and uh, RCA and all. Wonderful people. Every, yeah, and every one of them had an idea. But uh, every one of them had a, a thought of how to EQ the bass. You know, it was a lot of chefs in this, in this one. And I remember Donnie Kirshner being there, and he was just another one that had flown in from New York. And I had no idea who he was. I thought he was a gopher. At the time, uh, I apologized to him many times after this. I thought he was a gopher, and he said something about turning up the bass, and I poured a glass of ice over his head. 
<laughs> poured a glass of water and it just oh, started trickling down fun? like this. And he got up weren't very... Weren't you a you know, sweetheart, huh? Oh, it was after a 12-hour recording session. And here was a guy that had flown in from New York that, had, that I had no idea who he was. And he, he was getting coaxed for everybody. And he says, turn up the bass. <laughs> well, he's a nice oh, guy. Johnny. He's a wonderful guy. And he took, it. he took me outside and said, don't ever do that again <laughs> in front of these people. Uh, I apologize to him. It was a stupid thing to do. It was very hectic. See, we had to fulfill the roles of not only a television act, which records, or at that time filmed, 10 hours mm -hmm. a day. Um, we had to become musicians and record on the weekends and practice at night and then go out on the road. And now they're doing it a lot. Now they have the formula. But at that time, it was the first time anything like this had happened at hey, Columbia. Even, even groups today that go out and do concerts are not locked up in the uh, television studio or the, the sound stage. Not all week long. Donnie, Mar Donnie Marie tape in one hour. It mm -hmm. took us every day for ten hours to, to film that show. I have to stop for these words from our stations. We'll continue with the Monkees from Los Angeles after these messages. <laughs> Well, I can't believe Larry wrote this about it, your last second. Yeah, it, um, it surprised me when I read it. And only in, in years later did I realize that that's what was happening. Because at the time, I was just, hey, what's happening, Davey? All right, my <laughs> At the time, we were just bozo. Because of all that pressure and of the isolation. But when he writes that uh, you were spoofing and skits the stuff that was coming on later well, on, we did knew you, we were doing that. Did you know that you were We made it all up ourselves. We, Especially well, the second year, a lot of it came out. A lot of effort from a lot of people. Um, not just, uh, there was a lot of changes came around in Columbia Studios when the monkeys started. There was uh, people pulling cables that weren't supposed to be pulling cables, and there was ideas from the boom man and the, the sound man, and we even had the prop man doing a part in the show one week. So we got into a real That's good for family a show. sort of yeah, situation. Good for a show. Just as when you sit around here, these guys here are really into you, you know, and they can pick up on things that maybe the audience doesn't pick mm -hmm. up on. And so that sparks off brand new energy, and off we went again. And there was things I'm sure when we run through the monkeys and we can't believe we said them, you know? Yeah. Something. Well, if I asked you for some of the more outrageous things that you that you did at the time, that I couldn't tell you. looking back on... You couldn't tell me? I couldn't tell you on the air. <laughs> oh, no, no, you can. There was, there oh, was, know, there was nothing that too outrageous. Like, I guess the whole thing was outrageous. The whole thing was outrageous. With, uh, with everything that took place. But what after the first season, what they did for us, because we became a little bit of a problem. It was like when we would go into the commissary where everyone had their lunch, these four long-haired weirdos would walk into there, the whole place was empty. empty, you know what I mean? They just weren't used to it at Columbia. They tried to inspire within us inspiration and improvisation and spontaneity, but it's not something you can just shut off when you walk out of the, off the stage. So, so we went home, you know, hey, come home, home, give it a little they, bow, boom. They, built, <laughs> they went nuts. They knocked a hole in the back of the studio wall, uh, Studio 7 over at Columbia. And uh, it was like uh, they had a meat door with a meat uh, handle door <laughs> thing yeah. there. And there was at the other side was a black box. Yeah. It was 12 by 12 by 12. And there was a light in each corner of this box. When they wanted Peter, they would light up the green one, the red one, the blue one, the white one for each different person. We'd just be sitting around there on the near pillows and the candles. Two the girls <laughs> talking, hey, with some hey, soft music. Hey. Just go on. So all of a sudden, <laughs> bang, 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 bang. Oh, go, God, I got to go You go do walk. this scene. And we walk out on stage. Hey, what's happening? Oh, ho, ho, ho. You're in the black room. Yeah. And you're sitting on the pillows. Right. And you got the ladies in there. Well, sometimes. Yeah, okay. Uh, and, and, what, and what else did? Did you have anything to smoke in there? We had a little bit to smoke from time to time. Yeah? Yeah. You did it stone once in a while? Uh, oh, well, ripped. I got stone once. Ripped a up? long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, I guess towards the end of the second year. We were pretty isolated. Um... In fact, your producer I would tried say. to draw it me out today. Anything about stuff, drugs? And, <laughs> anything about drugs and broads? Yeah. He's a dirty, dirty man. No, there was very little. We he'll, were, we were he'll, so he'll be gone soon. Yeah, it was so, we were so isolated. I uh, isolated. It was so tough to get. So we didn't do any of it. We didn't even know about it for no, years no. after that. You know, we, we were so protected by this in, in conglomerate. Um, before we went out on so the road... So when you said they, you were El Ripto, you were just kidding. No, no yeah, I, I was. A few was. packages oh. got through the line. Yeah, you know, yeah they always do. <laughs> and we, During the, we second, the second year when things started loosening up, you know, um, <laughs> it, it, it got a little looser, but... Um, it, it, they kept it, they kept pretty tight reins on us, you know. They, um, I remember during the first year when we were going to go out on the road and do uh, press conferences, 
They were scared to death that we would come out and say, well, we're bigger than the Beatles, which means we're bigger than Jesus Christ, and even the Beatles, and we shoot Drano, you know what I mean? They were so afraid that we'd get out there, you know, being bozo like that. So they gave us this fake press conference. They called in the reporters from Screen Gyms in the press department. They sat us down at a table with the microphones and the water. That was the, the day the studio thing. closed for a day after the French press right. conference. Well, and they asked us all those it. questions. What do you think about the war? What war? You know, and we made up these answers. What do you think about acid? Oh, I, I use it to clean my pool all the time. <laughs> what do you think about fags? And Davy said, oh, I smoke them all the time. In England, you know, not... Peter says, not those kind of fags. I think all homosexuals... Say, no, no, don't say that, Peter. We can't get in trouble. <laughs> and I think it was wise because we wanted to... <laughs> we wanted to save our careers. That's right, we so wanted we to save our careers. <laughs> but more than that, we wanted to keep the fantasy, keep the keep the fantasy going and not get relevant you see what's crazy and i'll just i am just, just gonna bet that this happened is all those executives you know who had this whole thing they're controlling it they said now listen america's gotta think that these guys are wholesome and pure and they're virgins and they don't touch themselves and it, it, <laughs> right. just really clean cut kids hey, <laughs> 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 no that, that's exactly what they wanted well they couldn't get it on television it was tough enough getting long hair they, they went through all kinds of problems with NBC, just getting us on with long hair, because at that time, long hair meant either dope addicts or, or Jesus freaks. It meant a lot of bad things, so to get us on or gay. Monday night, or gay, you know, well, at that time, I don't even think they had gays. No, <laughs> no, no, they, no, they, didn't. <laughs> they didn't believe in it. They weren't legal then. Um, <laughs> no, but it's true. They were very, they were very worried, because um, it, it, I don't know, I think that, that Leary really captured the, the essence of it, because... It brought long hair and this youth and spontaneity and, and improvisation into the living room, which it hadn't it had been there before. It, had never, it wasn't in people's living rooms, at their dining room table. Kids brought home Beatles records and hid them under the bed or something, mm -hmm. or, or it was in movies. But now here were these four long-haired kids that didn't do anything bad. They didn't molest children, and they worked, and they were happy, and y'all thought, oh, aren't we wonderful? And the kids say, why can't I grow my hair long now? You know, the monkeys can do it. You know, it was, um, oh, bubblegum, you know. I think progressive bubblegum. You bubble must gun. have given the management fits. Oh, yeah. Absolute from fits. From time to time. From time to time. Did so. you ever do it for sport? So I did it for sport a few times. I used to, I was going to the studio for, for a whole year, and uh, this one guard one day must have decided that he had it in for, for Davy Jones, so he wouldn't let me through. I was a little late. So I said, if you don't know the thing, I'm going to go straight to it. So I, I go through, and the board goes flying all over the place, and Jackie Cooper calls me in his office and tells me I'm never to do this again. And I'm handing back the keys to the free car, and I'm on my way to England. You know. <laughs> Take that. I don't care. <laughs> the road is where it got bizarre. Yeah, I want to talk to you about the road, but I have to stop with these words from my sponsors. We'll continue with uh, Mickey and Davey from the, uh, from the uh, Monkeys. I almost said the Beatles. After thank you. Oh, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Welcome to your office. Take my wife, please. <laughs> if you only knew. How uh, you said the road was bizarre. How um, bizarre is the road? How was bizarre the... was it? Well, it's still bizarre. Um, it's still going on. The road is still there. It's still there. Yeah, but when the four of you uh, were <laughs> together, and it was all new and all exciting, and, you'd be, and you had them all waiting to see you out there. I like well, it now when it's old and familiar, <laughs> to tell you the truth. It was, it was crazy, because no, as I said, at that time, nobody really had the formula. So nobody knew how to, to like they have it now. Everything is really kind of... How did you behave yourselves on the road? Well, we didn't have much choice. We were shoved from the back of a limousine into a garbage entrance, into a hotel room into another garbage entrance, into a meat wagon that got us in the arena, then out onto stage, we came bursting out of big speakers. But if a fan really wanted to come in close personal contact... Well, one with, of them shipped herself with... to Davy. <laughs> <laughs> I swear, one of them packaged herself up and shipped herself to Davy. Wait, how, how did you do that? Well, she died. She didn't know. <laughs> she just, uh, I, I knew what was going on. They what, just, a box came to your door just one a day? Box, but I'm sure she'd make plans downstairs with a bellman or something. I had an experience last week, actually, in Sacramento, which was real funny. I was leaving my hotel room, and as I left, my, one of my shirts was sitting at the, uh, just right by the door on a little bench ready to go to the laundry. And uh, as I went, the sleeve wafted out the door. Well, there's been girls knocking on the hotel room all, all week, you know, just wanting to talk and get an autograph or something. Exactly. A few yeah. of them I've given it to, mm -hmm. you know. That's right. And uh, a few of them I just gave a picture to. Exactly. So 
<laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe have a conversation. Out of the door. Come on, and as, as I left, I didn't realize this, you see, so when I came back, there's this little frayed sleeve sitting out the door. Two young ladies had gone up and gone up and cut it off with a with a nail clipper. So uh, that I was think one the, of the fun things that happened to me last night. I think the was form funny. letter. Yeah, that was hilarious. <laughs> I I think the form letter paternity suits for a big highlight. When we <laughs> there's a lot of did we you ever get? I got I got about a half a dozen paternity suits mm -hmm. in places I had never been. There are a million laughs. Aren't I there? think I think what Tom wants to hear is about <laughs> people like the cla uh, the. Plastic casters in in Chicago, things like that, you know. Well, we'll, we'll hear, hear about, about the paternity suits, and then we'll get to the plastic okay. casting because that that's fun too. Well, I received letters that uh, claimed that I was a paternity, a, mm -hmm. a paternity, mm -hmm. right? And in places I'd never been, I gave them to my lawyer, and he says, "If you but you know something, here? that's power." <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and it turned out they were form letters that families of girls. Because I, I investigated it with other rock groups. And they said, oh, yeah, you got the letter from the Carlisles in Ohio. Mm -hmm. But they would send the letter to everybody, hoping that just to avoid the litigation, to avoid the problems, it you would send in your $5,000. Yeah. Tear off the top of this letter and send it in with $5,000. Right. <laughs> and we won't, and tell we 10 won't. friends about it, and soon everybody will be right. pregnant, and we'll all be getting $5,000. paternity <laughs> 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 Have you made oh. your contribution? It got crazy in England. I remember, boy, it was nuts over there. We were staying at the Royal, uh, in on the park of Royal Gardens or something like that, right next to Princess Margaret's house. And there was three or four hundred little kids out in the, in the park every day, and all day long. You know, Marky, Thaivai, Pay, all night long, all day long. And finally, <laughs> we got a royal note from Princess Margaret that said, "Would you please keep those stupid little stuff off the park?" A little royal note with a seal and everything. Did you give her a royal suggestion as to what she could do with it? I sure did, Tom. Uh, now on to plastic. <laughs> Were you plaster casted? No, I was never plaster casted. Uh, uh, but uh, I think Peter Tote was plaster casted. Yeah. Have you you've heard about the plaster casting? Oh, cast sure. One of the first shows we did, we had groupies on. Oh, yeah? We talked about plaster right. casting. Oh, yeah. Well, you know all about what goes on on the road. You know, there's a lot of things happen on the road. It got Some dangerous. of us take our wives, so they, not too much. But there's a lot of fun, a lot of parties, a lot of... A lot of good times. Jimi Hendrix was our opening act. Um, the first time we went out on the road. So we spent a lot of time just jamming in the hotel. Stephen Stills was on the road with us, not performing, but as a friend. And so we spent a lot of time just back at the hotel because we couldn't go anywhere. In Japan, we were uh, locked in our rooms because there was a, a murder threat, an assassination attempt on our lives. That's from another group. That was a big one. That was a lot of it. We laughed about that for years. So they brought in all the Nikons and the jewelry. We brought them out of our hotel rooms. Why did it all break up? Well, Peter Tork quit. That was the main reason. Well, he withdrew. Yeah. He he actually withdrew. He didn't just quit. There was a there was a reason for it. He was not being artistically satisfied in yeah. certain ways. And we were, as I say, Mickey and I had done other things before, and so we were used to taking the direction. So when he came down to other people, forgetting that Cal King and Neil Diamond, Harry Nielsen, and Neil Sedaka wrote all the tunes, and Mike and Peter also did, but they'd never got the chance really to put any on down in the early days. They decided that they wanted to do m more music, and Peter was the first one. He withdrew and said that he would prefer to try it on his own so he could do more of what he liked best, which was music. They'd been promised. Oh, right. They'd been promised, Mike and Peter had been promised, that they would be able to express themselves musically, because they were from a musical background. Right. Peter had been in New York with the, in the village, come through that scene with the mamas and papas and uh, a love and spoonful. And he's a genius. The man is a genius at music. Will you wait a second? And I gotta do some commercials. I don't want to say bye bye yet. I'll be right back after these words from our affiliated stations, so please stay tuned. We we're talking about Peter Tork and Mike Nesmith, the two monkeys right. who are not here tonight. Who are the musicians going in or had music? Basically. Background? That right. background in music. Basically the background in music. And as I said, Peter it it was and is a genius in music. And he got very frustrated because he wasn't able to, to satisfy himself creatively. And Mike, Mike felt the here? same way. I'm oh, sorry. Mike, um, Mike is the same way. He's also a genius. He is, has very country western flavors, which at the time the executives up there said, Country what? <clears throat> they had no idea. <laughs> Mike kept saying, Country western is going to be huge. And they went, No, no, Guna Guni Bangunya. It was very successful. They had to appeal to the greatest demographics, but they were not satisfied. They were not feeling that they were able to express yeah. themselves creatively. Davey and I as actors didn't really mind that much musically. We were getting off 
on the television show and on the comedy. And in the room at the back. <laughs> oh, good. The, the, the black room with the four spotlights. Really? Yeah. Peter is writing, writing songs. He's an incredible songwriter. And if you're watching, dummy, get some publishing because you're a great songwriter. And um, Mike is, has a record company, a very successful record company up in Carmel. A record company designed Why does Peter publish songs with Mike? That's a good idea. Really? Get those guys together. How friendly are the four of you to this day? We've talked the I'm new... looking at him now. No, we're really friendly. No, true. We're like that. No, we're real close. We talk quite often. We've talked about getting the monkeys together in the coming seasons. Uh, we seem to have been talking about it for a couple of years now. We're very friendly. We like one another. You work together and you, you get interested in one another as people. It's been mainly Mickey and myself this last few years professionally. And even Mickey and I... As, as entertainers, we're very close, but as, as personal friends, we really don't spend any time together at all. We, and we have never really, over the, over the years that we've known one another. What is it like the two of you working? Just two out of the four. Well, it, it's not fair to call it that, really, because, you know, we don't go out as the monkeys. We don't call it the monkeys, and everybody else does or tries to. It's Dolan's and Jones. And um, it's been very successful, professionally, and a lot of fun. We, um, we've got into the Las Vegas nightclub circuit, appealing to the old fans that have now grown up. We uh, just did Tom Sawyer at Sacramento Music Circus. Uh, incredible things sold out to little kids that weren't mm -hmm. even born when the Monkees was on originally, but have seen the show because the show is still on. We went to Australia and 3,000 kids tore down the TV station because the show just started showing there. Kids going through plate glass windows, I mean, right, <laughs> you know, which is a lot of fun, but. It's the sure. television shows are a masochist. It's great fun. Yeah. Speaking about the tours, I was going to say that that was the only thing that really stands out in my mind was the, the danger. I mean, it got really incredible sometimes. You hear stories about it, but it's, and it's all true. I mean, kids hanging under the cars going 30 miles an hour and getting whipped off and <laughs> We perform down the in different sorts of places. We, we go from Disneyland to a club like we have a, a tour coming up of clubs in Florida and we go into Canada where we do one-nighters and we we played years ago when we did the monkeys we played to 20,000 people in the cow palace but we're still playing to 20,000 people at Disneyland then we go into a club that's only got 1,500 people in Florida and it's really different our performance together I would think we have uh, sort of like a, um, uh, a Dean mean, Martin, what is it, Dean Martin, Jerry Lewis sort of a thing. He's a funny man. That's I set him up for that's the what we're working on. Jokes. And then we, you know, like... Uh, that's all professional, you know. We're going to uh, England, it looks like. We're going to go to England. No, he wasn't finished. Oh, with sorry. You, you set him up with the tricks. Yeah, well, and then we do different kinds of... I mean, that you do on the air. He travels, he's holding. He's got his wife with him on the road. I'm, <laughs> I'm, the, I'm, I'm the only guy that does the band, too. We have a great band called The Laughing Dogs. New York. My sister with sings with us, Coco Dolan. We have a good Does variety a show. The Mickey Dolan's, Davy Jones variety show. Mm -hmm. you know, show business of the now we're, and the future. We're right. going to England, it looks like, to do The Point for Harry Nielsen, who's asked us to come over and uh, star in The Point. Tremendously talented man. Oh, boy. I was out here in 1965 or 66 or 67, one of those years. I came out from Philadelphia to do a, a promotional bit with Otto Preminger for a picture called, I don't even remember the name of it, it was one of his pictures. And they were shooting this thing down off the uh, coast of San Pedro. Skidoo. Skidoo. Skidoo, right, off the coast of San Pedro. Okay. And I, the, the car from Preminger's thing had picked me up at the, at the hotel and taken me down, but the, the car couldn't bring me back. But the transportation chief of the picture said, well, there's a guy that it's, he's going right back to near your hotel. Why don't you ride with him? His name is Harry Nielsen. Wow. He and his wife are, Harry's watching, by the way. are, are, are riding okay. back in the car. So we just chatted on the way back. He had his wife with him, and they had the big Jaguar, and they were driving up the thing, talking about this and that. And I didn't know what he did. I said, what do you do? He said, well, I'm doing the music for the show, for this movie. And I said, oh, that's very interesting. Are you in music? And blah. I didn't know. So then, of course, about two years later, when uh, uh, the Lord in New York City and the Midnight Cowboy mm. and all that stuff that he did, which was just unbelievable, mm. I thought, you know, I rode in that guy's car. And I still <laughs> think about that. I rode in that guy's car and didn't even know who the hell he was. And he's watching you right now. Well, I'm, uh, I, that's fine, too. But, I mean, it's funny how you just meet people and you don't know who they are. No, it really isn't funny that you... <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting. It's interesting. Yeah, it is interesting. 
I have to pause for these words from my sponsors. We will continue uh, after these messages, so please stay with us. Some of them are. Oh, I'm sorry, Cher. I really am. That is a picture of Cher. Sonny and Cher. Sonny, Sonny and Cher. Cher. When was that taken? 1967, 66, What was 67? the occasion for it? Um, they probably, some press officer probably just, it looks like I'm, uh, it looks like I've been working. Uh, my hair's kind of messed up, so I'm probably in between shots. And some press guys come In between over, straightenings. In between hair straightenings, yes. Uh, and some press guy just probably ran over and said, Hey, there's two people, Sonny and Cher, come over here and take a picture. Mm -hmm. And that was it. Did that ever get to be a hassle? All the, all the hype, all the stuff that they ask you to do? Not, not for, for me. me. Not for me. There's an echo here. No, not for, not for me. I was used to it since Circus Boy, you know. I was really... What was Circus Boy? Circus Boy was an NBC show. Long time. It was before you were born. I'm oh, sure. no. Oh, no. <laughs> a long time ago. When was it on? 55. Was it nighttime show? It was 50. No, it was a children's show. It was a... Sunday night, 7.30. Not the circus. In the, 1955, I played a little kid, a blonde-haired kid named Corky that ro rode around on an elephant. That was in 50, 1955, I think. The kid, as I recall, was a real snot. Oh, yeah. He was a little puffed away, blonde cat. <laughs> <laughs> it was a little oh, pain in that kid. All right. That's a thing for elephants. Still does. Listen, don't talk about my elephant like that. So, uh... What else do you want to talk about? That's what I want to do. Well, I'm out of gas, to tell you the God's honest. Uh, yeah? Want to hear some more dirty stories, Tom, no, about no. the road? What about the, uh, the, uh... The money Screen Gems made? <laughs> well, I was going to ask you about the money, because you say that those shows are still in, uh, in syndication. You don't make a lot of money from reruns, obviously, because, uh... <laughs> no, but what about from all the... I mean, did it, did it set you for life? Do you really have to work... Why would we be doing this show? I have no, <laughs> no idea. I don't think you have ever, no idea. I don't think no. it'll ever set for life, uh, because once you get a lot of money, you want more money. That's what they say. But, uh... We made a lot of money from recordings and from uh, from uh, personal appearances, which we did over 200 of, as just four people standing on a stage, which blows any theory of the monkeys didn't play their own music, which we did, on all our concerts that we did. And we both, Mickey and I came out comfortable, and the other guys do well, and uh, there'll always be money because we'll always be entertaining. How do you think, though, that this whole experience, and let's face it, a lucky experience, and that you were two of the five, it was yeah. a roll of the dice when you went into the casting office or whatever it is. How has this changed your lives? What if this hadn't happened to you? What do you think you'd be doing? You probably know? wouldn't be doing this show. Well, that's probably true. It's made us famous. You know, I would probably be an architect or a scientist. I don't know, David, what would you do? I'd probably be riding horses at Hollywood Park, to tell you the truth. <laughs> <laughs> David was that's an apprentice what I want to do, folks. Okay. Put your money on me. But he, is, that, is that what you wished to do? Did you want to be a jockey? I was an apprentice for a year in England before getting into show business. And uh, that's what I wanted. The trainer told me the best thing to do, Dave, is to go away, get yourself some horses, and uh, also let me tell you this before you go, you ride like a sack of potatoes. <laughs> so that was it. I went and bought a couple of my own through the monkey's money, and uh, I did what he said, became an owner. But I love to ride. I ride all the time go out to the park to my friend John Canty, and he lets me work a couple of his horses from time to time. Mm -hmm. But uh, I love the outdoors. Sport. We didn't make nearly as much money as you probably imagined. No, we didn't know the name. No, I know that you didn't. Right. Because I have been around the business, and I know how money has a way of getting away from talent. Mm. And it, it also depends upon who's keeping the books as to how much people get from it. But you used the word, it made you famous, and that it did. Mm. Is that a good thing? Do you like being... Famous. It's the only thing I know. I, I don't really know what I do now. <laughs> I like the idea of walking down the street in Bangkok or wherever it is we go, which we travel all around the world all the time. When we're not uh, performing in America, we're either in Australia or we go to uh, Japan where we have a big following, Mickey and I. And we go to Bangkok and Singapore and Taipei, do a lot of traveling. And it's really, for me, uh, it's a great introduction into conversation to be able to mm -hmm. have someone come and say, Hey, Davy Jones, the monkeys. Say, so, yeah. No, it's easy to pick up broads. It's, it's, it's good for <laughs> being able to talk. <laughs> Sorry. We, we haven't had a laugh for about 15 minutes, so I feel we need to laugh. It's done nothing but good you, you are really, You are really incorrigible, aren't you? <laughs> oh, man. Would I not want to be your personal man? <laughs> oh, you must drive the man or the woman bonkers, for heaven's sake. Bozo, as you say. Bozo. Well. Does it ever get in the way, being known? Like if you and your lady are out for dinner and all of a sudden, hey! It's one of those uh, necessary evils. You know, you can't 
I try, I try not to ever put anybody off because uh, you just can't afford to. You know, you, people consider, people think that you are always working. It's like going to a doctor and saying, "Hey, my back." You know, people come up and say, "Hey, sing a song." You know, yeah. so I ask them what they do. I say, "Well, I pack boxes." Well, pack a box for me, so. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll sing your song. Girl. Pack a bag. I'm leaving. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really out of time. Thank you, Davy Jones, for being it's here pleasure. tonight. Mickey Dolans, it was awfully Thank good you, to meet you. Continued success, and thanks for a super hour. I enjoyed meeting you both. Okay. We will continue to explain what happened with the other part of the show, which was my fault. I'll be right back to apologize after these messages.